If you enjoy our videos and podcasts and would like us to continue putting out regular quality content, head over to patreon.com forward slash aircrewinterview where you can donate monthly and in return you will get rewards ranging from early interview viewings, bonus clips, credited as a producer and much more. Thank you and enjoy. So, Scotty, when did you first become interested in aviation? Uh, it was probably uh, due to my family. The majority of my family has been in the Air Force. Uh, my uncle had a big impact on me, actually. He was a, a Herc pilot, uh, and then uh, other uncles and aunts were uh, air traffic, and also even uh, chefs as well. So okay. I've always been around um, aviation, and then that's led to um, the love for flying and wanting to uh, join the Air Force. So what year did you actually join the Air Force? So I joined in 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, that was after having been to university uh, on a university bursary at Cardiff, uh, where I studied biochemistry. Uh, and then after the university, joined the Air Force, uh, starting officer training uh, after a summer off from mm. uh, 2010. So did you have, like when you joined the Air Force, an aircraft you wanted to join on, or the force you wanted to actually fly? <laughs> Definitely, so it was the Harrier. Uh, initially when I joined uh, and then unfortunately due to some um, external circumstances uh, that wasn't to happen uh, in uh, SDSR 2010 Harrier was removed from service which was a shame uh, but then that just uh, the aspiration quickly changed to getting onto F-35 when that was coming into service as well. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us some of the aircraft you started training on? Uh, so I suppose we could start back at Cadets when I first started gliding. Uh, that was uh, the first aircraft I ever flew and did a gliding scholarship in Cadets. Uh, and then went on to the Grob Tutor, uh, flying on elementary flying training. Uh, that was at RF Witten. Uh, so that was about 60 hours uh, flying there. And then after that moved on to the King Air aircraft, uh, uh, which is based at RF Cranwell on 45 Squadron. So yeah, the King Air. Like, let's talk about that because that's is it essentially a Beechcraft? Uh, yes. That, yeah. Correct, so tell yeah. us about what it was like to fly. Uh, it was actually a really good fun aircraft to fly. Um, in terms of uh, how powerful and advanced it was for a trainer, it was up there. Uh, you don't normally train on something so big and powerful at such a young age of your flying career. So that was really good fun to fly that uh, a two-engine prop aircraft. Um, doing low level formation flying as well, uh, something you don't get to do in such a, a big aircraft of that type, so it was good. So there was actually two types we had. Uh, we had the, the B200 and then the GT version. Okay. Uh, so you started off on the B200, which was just uh, old steam uh, driven dials, um, very basic aircraft. Um, but then as you got about halfway through the course, you moved on to the GT version, which is a complete glass cockpit. And so that prepared you for the modern cockpit that a lot of the front lines have, especially with the autopilot as well, um, getting to fly, procedural flying as well, and uh, using your uh, other crew member as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did the aircraft handle it? So one thing I will say, it definitely took a beating as a student. <laughs> so I still remember one of my first ever uh, asymmetric single engine landings, which I think uh, we actually went across the runway more than down it when we landed. <laughs> so they definitely took a beating, which was great. Um, so they were tough, they were a tough aircraft. But in terms of uh, handling, they were great fun that you could whack them around the, uh, the air a lot and um, yeah, have great fun, yeah. I got a question from one of our um, viewers. Did you ever go through the Mac loop? I did, yeah, went through a few times um, during the low level phase, um, which was actually really cool. Uh, you, you feel that once you get streamed multi-engined that um, you're obviously not going to get to do any of that stuff, but really, uh, thankfully, when you did go into Ford 5 Squadron, you still got to do low level and you still got to plan your sorties through the Mac loop, which were great fun, mm -hmm. especially seeing all the spotters oh, up yeah. on the hills <laughs> higher than you, yeah. <laughs> so how many crew were on the aircraft? Just two of us. Is uh, that it, right? Yeah, so just me and the uh, instructor, uh, you'd sit in the left, the instructor would sit in the right, and uh, then down the back was a bit like a business jet uh, of big leather chairs, but they were just empty. <laughs> Brilliant. So then you got streamed to the Voyager. How did this happen? Uh, so at the end of 45 Squadron on the King Air, uh, they uh, do a board uh, for everyone uh, with the senior officers of all the squadrons, and they decide which uh, fleet you're going to go to. 
so then there's a, a big day where we where it's announced and uh, normally uh, has some type of um, party as well um, and I found out I was going to Voyager yeah so that was uh, from RF Cranwell moved down to Bryce Norton so it must have been nice to get posted to something new and shiny yeah definitely <laughs> um, it was because uh, You'd, you've been in the train system for so long now, you just wanted to get to the front line and uh, fly something and uh, you know get on ops. Mm -hmm. And uh, Voyager was a great opportunity for that. So it was a, a quick uh, training system to get through and uh, become qualified as well. Yeah, so let's talk about your training. Like, How did that differ coming from the Beechcraft? Was it a big jump for you? Yeah, so uh, when you talk to a lot of uh, civilian pilots and they find out you went from a King Air to an A330, it's a bit of a shock. <laughs> uh, it definitely is a massive aircraft uh, step up, you know, biggest air aircraft the Air Force has ever had. And uh, But flying it, it doesn't feel like that. Um, you know, Airbus has this what's called fly-by-wire system, and so everything's very electrical, and there's no feedback when you're flying it, so it doesn't feel like you're flying a 233-ton aircraft. However, when you're doing the walk-around, uh, <laughs> when you compare the walk-around from the King Air to the 330, it definitely is uh, a wow moment of this thing's huge. Mm -hmm. So what squadron were you based with? Uh, so I'm on 10 squadron. Uh, Voyager operates two squadrons, 10 and 101. Uh, collectively, we're known as the Voyager Force. Um, however, uh, we do mix in with each other, we fly with each other and operate with each other and do uh, tasks together. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So is there much banter between the two squadrons? Uh, there is, um, but because we do everything together, um, there's not. it's not like a typical uh, what you hear of banter between fast jet squadrons. Yeah. We're doing so much together that you kind of just forget about the squadrons and it's more just um, get on with the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually, as far as you is, like, can you tell us the role of the Voyager? What is it just air-to-air -air refueling or does it do it? So it's primarily things? an air-to-air refueler, um, but it's also a strategic transport aircraft uh, where we can transport troops around the world uh, safely into theatre as well. We've also got the new, um, newly painted uh, Vespina jet, which uh, transports the royal family and Prime Minister uh, around the world as well. And, uh, and then it also uh, goes on regular exercises around the world uh, with our fighters or with other multi-national uh, airlines, uh, not airlines, sorry, um, air forces around the world and uh, partakes in air to air refueling there. Yeah. So you mentioned that before, but have you flown a Boris Force one yet? <laughs> I have, yes, but not the new painted one. Right. Uh, sorry, it's the same aircraft. I haven't flown it painted, mm -hmm. uh, but I have flown it when it was grey. So can you tell us what an average day like is for your Voyager pilot? Uh, so we have quite a regular um, and different amount of tasks, um, ranging from North Sea uh, towline air to air refueling trips, uh, which could be an all day event, uh, going up and training with the squadrons from Lossy Mouth or Coningsby. Uh, you could be on queue, uh, which we call, op we call Optanza, um, which could be ranging from three to four days. Uh, we are on uh, constant readiness uh, to be scrambled. Uh, you could be tasked with uh, a transport flight, uh, which could be anywhere in the world, uh, going you could be going east all the way to uh, Brunei, or you could be going west uh, to Calgary or to the Caribbean to um, transport troops out there, uh, including the Navy and the Army. And, uh, or you could be going on operations. Uh, so at the moment we're um, on operations in the Middle East on Opshada and also down in the Falklands on a 1312 flight. So where's the most exotic place you've been? Exotic. Um, <laughs> So during this COVID times, I have flown, uh, taking naval personnel out to Barbados and Antigua uh, for uh, some ships that are out there delivering uh, relief and uh, helping with the current uh, pandemic out there. So can you talk us through the cockpit of the Voyager? Is it all glass? It is. It's an all glass cockpit. Um, it is, in terms of an airline cockpit, it's rather old. But uh, for the RAF, it's very modern. Uh, we don't have many other aircraft like that um, on the transport fleet, that is. Um, so it's very all automated and um, does a lot, a lot of technological stuff uh, for you. So Scott, what are the strengths and weakness of the aircraft? Um, strengths, it's, uh, it's probably the automation and the, um, the amount of um, autonomy it has. Uh, it's, there's so many ways to skin a cat flying uh, the Voyager and it's, uh, it's not so much polling it around the sky as uh, fl proper flying. It's more about monitoring systems and the amount it does for you is uh, definitely a huge amount of strength. And it's also the... Um, the ability to conduct air to air refueling, but also very quickly change roles to transport troops around the world in a strategic transport role. Uh, there's no uh, change over time between the two of them. So okay. the seats are constantly there 
and then the fuel tanks are, con are obviously there as well that uh, can deliver fuel. Mm -hmm. um, weaknesses, um, I suppose it's just because the modern era now of flying, uh, you don't get much hands-on time, um, so perfecting skills of uh, flying um, is something that you always have to try and stay on top on top of and um, make sure that you're ready if you do need to fly it uh, mm -hmm. manually. Mm -hmm. well, I think it's cool uh, with the Airbus as well you've got the side stick don't That's you right, rather yeah. than uh, like yeah, the old so, York. <laughs> so there's no yoke or a centre stick it's a side stick uh, complete full uh, fly-by-wire uh, electrical system uh, like I said no feedback so you don't feel any um, any of the control uh, feedback from the con uh, moving parts and uh, yeah it's a pretty modern jet yeah, it's almost like a fighter, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah. It feels like, you're, oh, in terms of going from something like a King Air, it feels like um, you're flying a spaceship in like, <laughs> you know, yeah. like thrust vectoring. It's so um, accurate and uh, smooth. So what type of aircraft do you, uh, can the Voyager refuel? Uh, so we have the uh, Proven Drogue um, system, uh, so we can refuel any Proven Drogue uh, aircraft uh, that has that same system. Uh, we can obviously refuel the Typhoon and the F-35. Uh, B variant uh, in the Royal Air Force and also the uh, Hercules uh, from Bryce and then eventually will be the A400 as well. On operations uh, I've uh, also refueled a variety of aircraft including uh, F-18s and uh, Harriers as well. Harriers, uh, well and, right. and Rafales and uh, Mirages, yeah. So how long can the Voyager stay airborne? Uh, regularly uh, for a normal uh, AR task uh, as, as well as giving fuel and holding enough fuel for us to RTB. You probably stay airborne for about eight to nine hours if needed. Wow. And uh, yeah. Now I have to ask this, like, what kind of food do you eat on the plane <laughs> for these long missions? <laughs> well, so I, uh, I'm a bit sad. I actually like to re request healthy food, otherwise it could get quite out of control. <laughs> so no so, curries. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, it slowly could escalate into eating a lot of junk food. <laughs> so uh, I like to get salads or jacket potatoes or wraps. Well, yeah, stuff like that. Probably a but good a lot, call. But there's a lot of coffee drunk, definitely. I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> so, have you ever flown on any large exercises? Yes, so um, we have quite a lot of exercise on the North Sea uh, with the French or the Americans as well, which I've taken part in uh, from planning perspective and flying. Uh, but then I've also gone across to uh, America and taken part in Red Flag in 2019 as well. Yeah, we have to talk about Red Flag. What was that like going over there? Uh, it was awesome. Uh, it really was uh, great fun. Uh, you got to see a uh, planning, briefing, debriefing side to an exercise that you don't really get to see uh, in the Air Force uh, in the UK because we're not stationed at the same stations as the uh, fighters. But over there, when you're co-located, uh, you get to pick up on a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. What was it like working with your US counterparts, like in the tanker uh, world? Yeah, what it was pretty was cool. Like? Um, I actually got to go on a flight out on the F on the KC-135 uh, okay. to refuel some F-22s out there, which was really cool uh, that is an old aircraft but i mean they do a great job with that um compared to the voyager which is very modern mm -hmm. um but it was it was cool to uh you know bounce ideas off each other and learn how they operate as well yeah and was there much banter between yeah the crews like, yeah there sense? was there was a lot of banter um obviously sometimes uh, they don't get our english banter uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. we're being uh, co-located in the same planning room uh, meant there was a lot of banter and uh, yeah mm -hmm. chat so how long were you on uh, Exercise Reg Flag for? Uh, so I was actually out there for six weeks. Um, it was quite a long time, uh, oh. longer than the actual exercise, because I trailed the jets out there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then eventually I brought them back from uh, another exercise that they stayed on to do as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would you fly every day at Red Flag? Um, no, we didn't. Oh, the Voyager did, but not specifically me. Mm -hmm. um, so we worked on a kind of a, a planning fly, planning fly cycle uh, where you'd um, plan with all the other receivers and the other um, partakers in the day of exercise, work out what's going on, how much fuel needs to be given and where, and then the next day fly it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you also flew in the Falklands. Can you tell us about this and how did it differ coming from the UK to flying over there? Y yeah, so it's very different out there actually because there's no controlled airspace down there at all and there's no one for, you know, 300 of miles. Um, it's very much, it's your airspace to do what you need to do and train with. and. Uh, yeah, you've got the receivers down there, uh, the typhoons that you get to train with and um, yeah, have a good, good time. So did you enjoy working with the typhoons down there? Yes, uh, yeah, it's good fun. Um, you get to practice intercepts, um, do um, some 
uh, positive uh, IDs on it, a shovel as well. Um, and uh, you get just to use the airspace that you don't get in the UK because of all the airlines that are mm -hmm. flying around as well. Mm -hmm. What aircraft did you most, or do you like uh, refueling the most? Most likely the Harrier, um, just because I get to see uh, what I did initially join up to do to fly, <laughs> especially when, yeah, that, that's definitely awesome. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think you took one of the voyages over for the Red Arrows too. Was there was correct? actually two, yeah. So two, I was on yeah. the second one. Uh, taking out a uh, Jippo uh, flight out uh, towards Iceland and then on to Greenland and then over to Goose and then down to Halifax. And that was just uh, helping them navigate across the Atlantic uh, with some SAR cover as well and uh, allowing them into the airspace and doing their com communications for them. So Scotty, have you ever flew, uh, flown on any live exercises or live missions, sorry? Yeah, so we've got uh, one Voyager permanently based in Akrotiri at the moment uh, on Operation Opshader as part of 903 EAW, which is uh, the so-called uh, fight against uh, Islamic State. And uh, we fly missions out of there, yeah, over the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what kind of aircraft would you be refueling over there? So there's a mix of uh, coalition aircraft uh, flying on Opshader uh, from our own Typhoons, uh, and then also American uh, receivers and also French as mm -hmm. well, yeah. Is there a nation that uh, easier to work with, would you say? easiest would be us yeah, yeah. there's no communication uh, barrier we know exactly what we're doing and uh, we know the the SOPs that we operate to mm -hmm. um, when we fly over uh, or refuel of operations uh, of a nation sorry uh, there are procedures that we carry out to make sure that it's as smooth and, and as easy as possible yeah and do you ever work with the army and navy um, only transporting them uh, I've never actually uh, refueled uh, any army or navy uh, aircraft as such uh, but we do transport them around the world mm -hmm. yeah and is there any plans in your future for an exchange tour maybe going on to the US types uh, there are uh, words about uh, an exchange with the Aussies uh, on flying with their KC-30 uh, uh, which is a, a Voyager uh, similar aircraft, uh, so that'd be interesting. So, is there any plans uh, in your future to head out to a, another red flag, for instance? Uh, potentially, yeah. I think we try and rotate as many of the pilots through the exercise as possible. But there's other exercises we do. We've been to Singapore on a uh, Basama Lima. Uh, we've been out to Oman on Magic Carpet and Safe Surreal uh, exercises. So there's those uh, coming up as well. Uh, but yeah, it would be great to get back out on red flag and uh, do it again. And as a tanker pilot, do you think you get to see a lot more of the world than you would if you were a fighter pilot, for instance? I definitely, yeah, I definitely think so. Um, as we're regularly tasked with uh, transport flights around the world or uh, working with other nations uh, providing air to air refueling. So do you, um, do you work with any of the old boys, like the VC-10 guys? Yeah, we still do have some VC-10 uh, pilots and uh, rear crew around uh, carrying out the mission systems operator role. Uh, we've also got some TriStar guys as well. Uh, okay. So, yeah, it's, you hear a lot of stories from them and uh, it's good to learn from them as well, uh, mm -hmm. from their uh, previous experience. Mm -hmm. So how much fuel can the Voyager actually hold? Uh, so it can carry 111 tonnes of fuel, right. uh, max takeoff weight of 233 tonnes, uh, and that fuel is uh, usable by us and then also uh, uh, able to be given to the receivers as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how much would you offload to, let's say, a thirsty typhoon? Uh, a thirsty typhoon, you could probably give about six tons, six, seven tons, if you're going to fill it all the way up. Um, that they might not take that uh, they, due to the mission they're carrying out. Uh, but that would normally take about 15 minutes uh, to refuel the typhoon. 15 yeah. minutes, right? Yeah. So where's the favourite place, or a favourite place you've actually flown the, the Voyager at? Uh, favourite place? Um, probably have to be in, in Vegas. Uh, it was good fun flying with all those different aircraft uh, out of Nellis Air Force Base. Uh, I haven't seen so many variety of aircraft on one exercise and so it was really cool to be uh, taking off and landing in between and you know around them. And do you mix with the fighter guys or do you like tend to stick to a type you know or, or do you all just mix? Mainly more one? just banter between each other <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah you know each other from previous experience university and flying training so you're always able to grab a beer mm -hmm. uh, with them yeah. Brilliant. So how would you sum up the Voyager um, in its current role? Uh, current role, um, I mean, it's an, a key enabler. Um, key, uh, I mean, one of our bosses used to have a, an expression of taking the fighters to the fight and keeping them in the fight. And as cheesy as that sounds, it is kind of what uh, every day is about and uh, providing that uh, capability on uh, keeping the fighters 
longer uh, over the area of operating. And you've recently become captain. Can you tell us about this? Yes, yeah, so uh, last year I moved from the uh, right-hand seat to left-hand seat uh, on my command upgrade, uh, which I got recommended for, uh, which was a great um, achievement for myself. Uh, and now it's uh, awesome flying as the captain and uh, you know running it as you want to run and uh, you know and just leading the uh, the mission yeah so is there a big difference between the left hand seat and the right hand seat if you know if you're a pilot or like on oh, airbus i suppose you could say as big difference as you're now flying with your left hand yeah. uh, i'm left-handed so it wasn't much of a, mm -hmm. a change but for some people it has been a difficulty changing hands uh, mm -hmm. for the stick um, but at the end of the day, uh, the biggest change is that everything comes on your head. If anything happens, uh, you're uh, responsible for it. That must be yeah. quite scary at some point. Yes, yeah, <laughs> it, is, it is. But at the, it's uh, it's great to uh, to have that um, responsibility and, mm -hmm. and enjoy it as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, how many hours uh, have you got on Voyager so far? Uh, I've got sixteen hundred uh, now on Voyager, and uh, yeah, um, and still going, still going strong. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. So Scotty, do you have any hobbies? Uh, yeah, so I love sport, all uh, types of sport. I uh, represented the Air Force at cricket uh, during my training, uh, when I was on flying training and after officer training. Uh, unfortunately, that's had to uh, slip away and um, now being on the front line and going and deploying regularly. Uh, but I've got into uh, weightlifting now as well and uh, do that, uh, which is easily manageable as it's a, an individual sport. And uh, yeah, love anything to do with fitness and health, uh, cooking, um, and then also just getting out and seeing the world and tourism. Yeah. Brilliant. Favorite aircraft you have flown? Favorite aircraft I've ever flown? It'd probably have to be the King Air, uh, just because it it was good, fun aircraft that uh, had a good amount of power and also uh, a good syllabus that allowed you to uh, put the aircraft through its capabilities. Mm -hmm. Is there an aircraft you would like to fly in the future? Um, I'm. I mean, I'd love, my ultimate dream would be to fly the Lancaster on the Battle of Britain Memorial flight. Uh, obviously that's not a full-time job, but that would be my ultimate aircraft to fly. Uh, I'm looking at all options at the moment, um, maybe transferring uh, to any other fleet uh, within the multi-engine world. Uh, uh, we've got the Wedgetail coming in in 2023. Oh yeah. Uh, Waddington, which would be a, a cool aircraft to look at flying, I think. So that's an option. I thought you were going to say Spitfire maybe or something, because all pilots seem to see the Spitfire. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I was thinking more from a... A multi-engine. Or more from what I can definitely do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, rather than just saying something like, yeah, F-22. <laughs> yeah. Special. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Scotty, can we find you online anywhere? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, yeah, I'm regularly posting on there about uh, educational stuff about the Voyager. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the interview. It's been a pleasure. No, thank you very much.